Amen. And please now remain standing and we'll read our sermon text together. This is found on page 1197. It's Hebrews 13. We will uh, get a running start with um, beginning in verse 8, but the focus for today will be Hebrews 13, verses 15 through 16. Um, So Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city. But we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. As far as the reading of God's holy word, you may be seated. Let's pray. Our great God, thank you for the practical instruction you give us in your word. You tell us awesome things about how great is your salvation, but you also tell us very clearly how we should then respond. And Lord, we do want to respond. We don't want simply to know things about you, although we do, but we want to live it. We want our faith to to be real. And so we pray, give us humble hearts, eager hearts, and teachable hearts. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, think back on your life. Have you ever received a present that is so huge, so like mind-blowingly generous that you scarcely know how to respond? Something that was so costly, so over-the-top, kind, and loving, where your breath is just like taken away. You're like, wait, for me? (laughs) Um, And you know that at least you should write a thank you note, but even there, like, how could you, how could you say, (laughs) like, what their gift means to you? Um, As I was thinking about this, uh, the thing that came to my mind was the gift of my childhood. Um, You know, once you become a parent, you start to realize, okay, this is a lot more like costly, more difficult than I ever appreciated. Um, You start to see in a new light all the things your parents did for you, all the the special trips, like, wow, there's a lot involved in that. The the birthdays, all all the driving around to different sports and learning opportunities and everything, and even just the everyday provision and sort of constant provision of love and stability and kindness. Not everybody has that. Right? What a gift. And as I thought back years ago, like, how can I respond to this? Like, this is a really incredible gift that I was given. Um, it's a present that no one could ever repay. Like, repayment is not on the radar here. Um, but it calls for a response. And I'd, I remember just deciding, I'm just going to write them a letter detailing some of my memories, all the things that I remember them doing, recognizing now that I understand a little bit more of what it costs them and thanking them. And as we, we think about the letter to the Hebrews, it's, it's a letter that has been detailing in absolutely magnificent terms a really huge gift, the gift of salvation from God to us through Jesus Christ. It is a staggering gift. I mean, just think of the sermon last week. Do you remember how you... He was talking, Pastor, Pastor Ivy, about the gift of assurance, the fact that we can walk into the presence of God 
and not be afraid. The fact that we can enter into his presence knowing that we're going to be accepted. That is incredible. So as we think about this incredible gift, Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, has been offered on the cross. His blood decisively cleanses us from all of our sins. We now can boldly enter into the most holy presence of God. What are we supposed to do in response? And as the letter is winding to a close here, he's been talking about lots of things. But particularly when we think about, okay, nobody can ever pay God back. This gift is way too big for that. That's certainly not in view. But is there anything that we can offer in response that would be suitable? Is there anything that, that, would, that would rightly show our gratitude? Well, yes, there is. And that's what we're going to hear about today. In fact, he speaks today of two things that we can offer in response to God's love. Two kinds of offerings. The first offering is in verse 15. This we'll look at first. God asking us to give a sacrifice of praise. And then the second, verse, excuse me, in verse 16, he'll talk about the sacrifice of good and loving works, good deeds to others. So these are the two two offerings God wants us to bring. And what we're going to ask thirdly is, are these actually acceptable offerings? Like, in the face of so great a salvation, like, isn't everything that we return just pathetic? Like, isn't it, isn't all the, all our, doesn't the Bible say all our works are like filthy rags before God, tainted with sin? Are these, are these gifts that we're bringing, praise and good works, are they actually acceptable to God? That's what we'll see at the end. So, as we dive into verse 15, first point, remember how he's been talking about so great a salvation. The salvation that Jesus has offered to us, it blows out of the water what God did in the Exodus, right? Um, <clears throat> that was a wonderful gift, that salvation. But what he did in Jesus Christ is so, so much more. Here, finally, is the decisive fix to sin's brokenness. All of sin's effects. The, the, the many ways in which sin corrupts us and then that corruption works its way out in damaging ways in relationships and in this world. Jesus has come to reverse all of it. He has come with, and he is so, he's so going to save us and he is already in the midst of doing this that there will be no stone left unturned in terms of the damaging effects of sin. He's going to reverse it all. So, at the very center of that salvation, the central dilemma every human being faces is the fact that we are not in fellowship with God, naturally. We all, every single one of us, even really nice people, have sinned against God. We've dishonored Him. We've not given Him our whole heart. We've not loved Him with all that we are. And we have instead turned our hearts to idols and given our hearts to other things other than God. And so Jesus, what did he do? He's our great high priest. He's come and he's offered the sacrifice that takes that central sin, central problem away forever. He's cleansed us from all unrighteousness. He's made us clean decisively so that we are completely forgiven. And we can now have fellowship with God. And now he's saying, in light of this great sacrifice, In light of this, therefore, let us through him, that is through Jesus, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. And when we think of sacrifice, when we think of that word, usually the the ideas that like immediately come to our mind are a blood sacrifice that's taking away sin. So like in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, you know, they slay the bull and they bring the blood into the most holy place, right? That's, that's what we usually think of when we think of the word sacrifice. And that is certainly one of the things that the word sacrifice means. But what we sometimes forget is that there are other kinds of sacrifices than those atoning sacrifices in the Bible. We should remember that, yes, there were some that were for taking away sin, different kinds of sin, but there were also, in Leviticus 7, what is called the peace or fellowship offerings. And its purpose 
was not so much taking away sin, but actually rejoicing in God's presence because our sin has been forgiven. The purpose of the fellowship offering was to offer our joy to God. And it's the one sacrifice where the everyday Israelite gets to actually enjoy some of the animal that is offered, some of the meat that's offered. What's the idea? The idea is, hey, I'm now in fellowship with God. Now I get to eat at table with God. I get to enjoy presence, the presence of God, and I get to feast in God's presence. That's what it means to be in fellowship, right? You're sitting down to table with them, rejoicing with them. And so this is where I think the word offering might better capture what's going on in our, our text, um, as opposed to sacrifice. The idea of offering, something that is freely offered to God in love out of the joy of fellowship that we have with him. Something that is celebrating the wonder of our forgiveness, the forgiveness of our sins, which the other atoning sacrifices had achieved. And, and now, understand, this is why this part of the sacrificial system in the Old Covenant is so important for us to know. We know that what Jesus did on the cross was the great sacrifice to take away all sins. He, he needed to bleed and to die to take away our sins. That needed to happen. And any further attempt to sacrifice and to atone for our sins in that sense would greatly dishonor the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. Right? Remember all through Hebrews 7 through 10, he's saying, look, they had to keep offering these sacrifices year after year after year to atone for their sins. Why? Because it wasn't the decisive atonement. They, they didn't actually really take away sins. It was just picturing the taking away of sins. Now the great sacrifice, the once-for-all sacrifice has been offered. Jesus doesn't have to keep on dying. He's died once. And now our sins are decisively dealt with. It would greatly dishonor Jesus to offer additional atoning sacrifices, but now what he wants us to see is that we should be continually offering this other kind of offering or sacrifice. This fellowship offering that was pictured in Leviticus 7 is pointing toward something that we get to fulfill in Jesus. The other sacrifices, they're all fulfilled entirely by Jesus alone, but this other kind of sacrifice, the fellowship or thank offering, sacrifice or offering, that's something we get to fulfill in Jesus. Jesus Christ. In fact, it, as we think about this question, what would most please God in response to the once for all unrepeatable sacrifice of his son? Answer, verse 15, our own continual offerings of thanksgiving and praise, where we're celebrating the fellowship that we have with God. That's pretty amazing. And that is something we need to figure out how to do because it's really important. So how do we do it? Verse 15. Our sacrifices, if they are to be acceptable, or our offerings, these thank offerings, if they're to be acceptable, they need to be made through Him, through Jesus. It says, through Him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice or offering of praise. What's it saying? It needs to be through Him. In other words, anytime you approach God in worship, whether it's here, you know, all of us together, or in the privacy of your own private prayers, and when you're doing family worship, you're always coming through Jesus Christ. And, and that's part of why when we pray, we always invoke the name of Jesus Christ. You know, at the end we say, in Jesus' name. That shouldn't be this little like, oh, this is how I close my prayers. I mean, it's meaningful. Because what's happening is you're saying, Jesus is my mediator. He's my go-between, between me and God. As I offer up my praises and my thanks to him, it's like he takes them, perfects them, and offers them to the Father. We're offering them through him to the Father. You're not offering these sacrifices of praise and of thanks as a substitute for Jesus' sacrifice. Rather, you are offering them as a response of love for his sacrifice. In fact, you're offering it in his one sacrifice to God. Because that one sacrifice makes you acceptable, in that one sacrifice, you are offering 
all your praises and your thanks. That's going to have big implications on why they're acceptable. We'll get back to that. But second is this. So you're thinking, okay, I need to be making these offerings, these offerings of thanks and praise. How do I do this? Well, you need to praise Him. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. Praise is when we adore and love and honor God. And what I want you to notice is that it's not just something we do when we sing. Look at how the verse defines praise. Praise, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. So when you are acknowledging God and the glory of who He is in whatever way you're doing it, you are praising Him. So when we confess our faith, as we did when we said Psalm 116, do you realize that was the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name? When you are um, taking the Lord's Supper, when we're all taking the Lord's Supper together, what does 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 say? We declare the Lord's death until he comes. We're acknowledging what he did. There's something we're saying as we're coming up and receiving the elements. Or again, when you're with your non-Christian friends or co-workers and you're telling them about what Jesus has done for you, you are acknowledging his name and you are praising. You're saying, Jesus is great. You should love him too. Now here's where I want to remind you of something really important. You must praise him. You must. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of these things where in, in America we, we have this idea of like, oh, it's got to be like from the heart if it's going to be genuine or true. And that means it has to be like spontaneous. And if I'm not feeling it, eh, no. <laughs> Don't fall into that trap. You must praise him. This is the offering he appoints as a response of thanks. It'd be like, here's this enormous present, and you're just like, Psh, and you don't say thanks. You don't write the thank you. you just like, whatever. No, this is, the, this is the suitable response from a heart that appreciates what God has done for us. I think sometimes as Christians, we get it in our head, it's sort of optional to, to praise God. Like, we, we come to church when we feel, we feel like it, but, you know, when we don't feel like it, it's okay. Uh, no, you, you have an, a, an offering you need to make, an offering of praise. You need to be here to offer that thanks and praise to Him. And I've been thinking about this, too, as I was thinking about, okay, how do I struggle with this, personally? I've been thinking about, like, all the swirl of thoughts that are going through my head all day, every day. And what's in there? Well, I was struck by how few of them are praises. <laughs> like, there's, there's a lot of worries. There's self-accusations. There's complaints. Where's the praise? <laughs> God didn't save us so that this would be, like, on repeat. He saved us so that there would be praise coming from us. Brothers and sisters, God wants your whole life to be an offering a sweet-smelling aroma of praise. All those things I was just mentioning, the complaints and everything, what are all, they're all the opposite of praise. Praise, thanks, the fruit of joy. God likes it. He wants that. He saved us, not so that he would get weeds, but he'd get the beautiful fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. That's the first offering. The second thing God wants us to offer, verse 16, in response to all Jesus has done, is our love for other people. Verse 16, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So, think about what he's saying. Doing good and sharing what you have. That's pretty broad. Doing good, sharing what you have. Like, that's capturing pretty much the entirety of, of love of neighbor, right? So, doing good. I mean, we're, we're talking about everything. We're talking about speaking kindly to your children when they're disobedient. Or treating your, your co-worker with dignity and respect even when they're super annoying. It means bringing a meal or mowing the lawn of somebody who's in need. It means volunteering at church or in your community. It means taking a younger Christian out to lunch and just asking him, Hey, how are you doing? It means praying for somebody who's going through hard stuff. 
It means doing your job at work excellently so that other people don't have to come along and clean up after you. It means kids doing chores that you don't have to do, but that you can do because it's a blessing to the people in your home. It means kids being friendly to everybody. Remember, doing good. It means being friendly to everybody, even the people that you wouldn't naturally gravitate to. Doing good means sacrificing lots of little fun things so that you can then share what you have with others. Share what you have. It's not just about money. It's about, I mean, it is about money and it is about your things, but it's also about your time. It's about your talents. It's, it's saying, look, hey, I could help with that. I'm going to offer that to my, my neighbor, but also to God. And what I want you to notice is that it is an offering. Verse 16, with such offerings or sacrifices, God is well pleased. And I know I've shared this before. I love this though so much. The lady at the mailroom in Wheaton, God bless her. On, her, on the door of her office, the mailroom at Wheaton College was, this is my offering offering. And so here's this lady that, you know, most people look at her job and say, that's a pretty lowly job, moving the mail around on campus, right? But she did it as her offering to God. And she did it well. And she did it joyfully. And she was always greeting people and encouraging people. And she was just a a joyful, blessed person to be around. This was her offering. And it was a beautiful offering. Do you realize your entire life is meant to be an offering to God? I think that when you get this, it changes entirely how you do everything that you do. The kids, when you do your schoolwork well to the glory of God, this is my offering. I don't really feel like doing the algebra homework. I'm going to do the algebra homework, and I'm going to do it well, because this is my offering. Or whatever, whatever it is, when you show mercy to others, And give generously to the deacons so that they can love the people in our midst and and in our community. Do you realize this is your offering to God? And, And I think that just one of the most dangerous errors that the church has fallen into over the years is this idea of what's called pietism. It's this idea that you're only really serving God and you're only really offering your life to God if you become a pastor or a missionary or something like that. No. <laughs> and I hope that there are people who will, young people who will come to this passage and says, okay, do good to all, offer what you have, share what you have with all. I hope some young people will come to this passage and ask themselves, is God calling me to one of those wonderful callings of being a pastor or sharing the good news with some nation that's never, never even heard the name of Jesus? Because that is, those are amazing ways of loving neighbor and offering yourself to God. But if that's not God's call in your life, do you see that your life of love for others in the name of God is an offering? Like everything, like cleaning toilets, changing dirty diapers, taking out the trash, it's your offering. It's your offering to God. It's your love offering. Here's what it's saying. It's saying, from the little things to the big things of life, I love you, Lord. I love you, and I'm so grateful that you saved me. I know I'm now not my own. I've been bought with a price. My life is now entirely yours. So here it is. Here's all of it, everything. It's all yours. And I just pray that you would hold nothing back. I pray that you would hold nothing back, that we would hold nothing in our lives back and say, this is mine. Hands off, God. That we would be quick to offer every dimension of who we are to Jesus and to his agenda and say, Lord, if you want it, I give it. And you want it all, I give it all. Because I love you. Are there things you are holding back? Are there like untouchable areas where like, okay, I'll serve God in these things. But please, I I don't want to have to offer this. You need to offer it. You need to offer your entire self on the altar. Offer yourself wholly to him, promptly and sincerely. He deserves all of us. Now, here are the two sacrifices. 
sacrifice of thanks and praise, sacrifice of doing good to others. Here's what God, God's going to say about those sacrifices. I like it. I really like it. Do you believe that? That's what verse 16 is saying at the end. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And a few other passages say the same thing, just in case you're like, is there like some textual error here? <laughs> something like, is that what it really says? Um, Romans 12.1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Philippians 4.18, Paul says to the Philippians, I've received that financial gift that they sent. I've received that gift that you've sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And in my experience, this is just one of these severely understated truths of the modern church. We are used to having our good works downplayed. And so they ought to be if we are proud enough to think that our good works could ever contribute to our salvation and atone for our sin. Like, no. You, your good works do not add a tidbit, a, a little, little cent to the immense worth of Jesus' sacrifice to take away your sin and make you acceptable to God. Okay, if we think our works can contribute to that, they deserve to be downplayed, and they deserve to be uh, like, no, only Christ is sufficient. We never want to usurp his place. We never want to rob from his glory. When we are forgiven of God, uh, by God, it is entirely because of the merits and the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. We are not saved because of anything that we have done. God doesn't look at us and he doesn't say, he doesn't look at us and say, well, you've been especially good, so I'll forgive you. No, when it comes to eterning, earning eternal life, we cannot. Only Jesus can. It's only a grace gift. But now, okay, we get that. We've heard that a, a lot and that's good. That's important because the world largely does not understand that at all. We need to say that. But now here's the other side that is so rarely also stated. If you are one with Jesus by that great sacrifice, if you are in him, in the sense that you believed in him and now he's forgiven you, you're, you're his child because of that great sacrifice on the cross, then guess what? You are pleasing in God's sight. You are pleasing. When you offer your obedience to God, he's no longer seeing all the imperfections, all the ways in which sin taints what you do. Are they still there? Well, of course they are. Does he know? Because he's omniscient. Yes, yes, yes. But they're just not in his purview. What is he seeing instead? He's seeing you through the lens of Jesus. He's saying, ah, oh, this is great. This is beautiful. And he is pleased. And it's not because we're perfect yet, but because Christ is perfect. Remember Hebrews 2.12, how Jesus is singing praises to the Father? You know, in that passage, it's picturing Jesus as our worship leader. He's the one singing as a man to God in praise. And we are in the worship leader. In other words, we're following the worship leader, singing with him. As a man, his worship is beautiful and absolutely acceptable to God. Now here's the corollary. If you are in him, and you're praising in him. Your praise is beautiful and acceptable to God. Again, verse 16, do you believe it? For such sacrifices of praise and of doing good, such sacrifices are well-pleasing in God's sight. My sense is that a lot of Christians are just very defeated about this. We're saying to ourselves things like, I'm not good enough. All my attempts to love, they're just so lame. Or, this is even worse, we try to offer alternative sacrifices. We, we beat ourselves up about our sin, and we think, I'm just going to feel really, really guilty, and that'll, like, pay for it. Or, and this is really bad, hurting ourselves, even physically. Or denying ourselves things, not for the sake of loving God or loving other people, like, that's one way we can deny, right? But denying ourselves things because we think to ourselves, I don't deserve this. 
I need to punish myself. Those sacrifices do not please God. They do not honor God. Because what are they saying? They're saying, I don't think Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient for me. They are denying God's love. They're a form of self-hatred. God may love me, but I hate me. And what I think trumps what God thinks. That's what we're saying with the bad sacrifices. And unfortunately, that's what we often slip into, especially when we've done something really wrong. Like, okay, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be really, really good, and I'll, I'll do all these things that show that I'm, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to pay for it. Right? But he has showed the young man what the Lord requires of you. Micah 6 is why we read this. God desires mercy and love, not sacrifice. Like, what shall I offer to the Lord <laughs> for you are forgiven by trusting in the blood of Jesus And therefore, your praises and your offerings of love are pleasing to God, as pleasing as Jesus is. And God, when he's looking at what you're doing, he's not thinking like about our praises. He's not thinking, wow, that was off key. (laughs) He's not thinking, man, the lyrics of this song are just so weird. (laughs) He's not thinking that. He's not thinking, "Uh, just look at how how all their praises are mixed up with like feelings of self-importance and wondering what other people think and all these self-righteous thoughts. He's not thinking that. He's, he's delighted in you. He cherishes your praises the way a parent cherishes the gifts a child gives. And God, when he looks at your acts of service for others, the way in which you share and give of yourselves to bless others, it's the same thing. He is well pleased. He is well pleased. He's not like the parent on the sideline saying, hey, why didn't you run for second? You could have gotten a double. No, he's saying, Great hit. And he's pleased. For many of us, the most important line that we need to meditate all week long on is, end of verse 16, such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Let's live as though that's true. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the sacrifice of Jesus that makes us pleasing And thank you that you give us these ways in which we can respond rightly to your great sacrifice in a way that in no no way uh, takes away from the grandeur and the uniqueness of Jesus' sacrifice. Thank you for these beautiful sacrifices of praise and of good works that we're to offer continually. Lord, help us to do so joyfully, knowing that you find us deeply acceptable through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.